The castles of Britain, grand and beautiful, majestic and imposing. Some have been maintained throughout the centuries, but others have been forgotten, left to decay into history by ages past. But why were they built? Who were the men and women that built them? What events took place within and around their walls? And what stories can these age structures tell us today? Join me as I take a brief dive into the history of the castles of Britain. Today we take a brief look at Skenfrith Castle in Monmouthshire, Wales. Skinforth Castle lies in an area of Wales historically known as the Welsh Marches, or the Welsh Marchland, which is in southeast modern-day Wales. This area being called the Marches was essentially another way of saying that they were near the border of England and Wales. After William the Conqueror invaded England in 1066 and took over the country after defeating Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings, the Normans set about controlling the population of their newly conquered land. Part of this process included constructing castles across the landscape as power bases to enforce their rule, and this is where Skenforth Castle's origins begin. After overrunning the land that would eventually hold Skenforth Castle, it is believed that the Normans constructed three castles in relative close proximity to one another in what would eventually become Monmouthshire, Wales. These castles included White Castle, Grossmont Castle, and of course Skenforth Castle, named for the village of Skenforth, which is situated next to the castle. Although there were also other castles that would be built relatively close, such as ones in Monmouth or Abergavenny, the three castles of Grossmont, Skenforth, and White would all eventually be grouped together and eventually be colloquially referred to as the Three Castles. To give perspective, Skenforth Castle, the furthest east of the Three Castles, is about 5.25 miles or 8.45 kilometers from White Castle, which is to the southwest and about 4.12 miles, or 6.63 kilometers, from Grossmont Castle, which lies to the northwest. It is unclear exactly when the three castles were built, but it is believed that they could have initially been built by William Fitz Osborne, the Earl of Hereford, during the time of William the Conqueror, but these structures would have been made of wood at that time. The three castles would not have been grouped together at this point into a separate lordship, but would still all have been under the control of Fitz Osborne as Earl of Hereford. After Fitz Osborne died, his second son, Roger, inherited his estates, but rebelled against William the Conqueror in 1075 in the so-called Revolt of the Earls, which caused the Conqueror to seize all of Roger's estates, including the three castles. With the crown now controlling that area, the castles and or estates began to be given away piecemeal during the reigns of William Rufus and Henry I. In 1135, the year of Henry I's death, the Welsh rose in revolt, which caused the then new king, Stephen, to exchange lands for control of Skenforth Castle along with White and Grossmont. It was at this time that the three castles came into being as an official lordship known as the three castles discussed previously. A royal official named Ralph of Grossmont during the reign of Henry II began to make improvements during this time, which included the beginning of transitioning at least one of the castles, White Castle, from wood to stone. At Skenforth, Ralph also made repairs to wooden structures there, but there is evidence that there was probably a stone keep or hall that was constructed around this time as well. Nevertheless, these structures would be wiped away eventually, which we will touch on shortly. By the beginning of the 13th century, 1201 to be precise, the at the time new king, John, granted the three castles to a man named Hubert de Burr. Hubert de Burr played an important part in the English monarchy during his time, as he played key roles in the reigns of King John and Henry III. He would fall in and out of favor with King John and Henry III, eventually become Chief Justiciar of England, played a large role in controlling Henry III during his regency, and was famously involved in guarding King John's captured nephew, Arthur, who would eventually disappear under suspicious circumstances. The three castles were, for a time, granted to a man named William de Prowse after de Burr had been captured on the continent, but de Burr eventually was able to gain the three castles back during the reign of Henry III when he was vying for power. 
Newcastle technology was being developed on the continent, and Hubert de Burr, who had experienced these Newcastle designs, began to utilize this new technology to update the three castles substantially. Most of de Burr's updates were believed to be geared towards Genfrith and Grossmont, while White Castle was not said to have been updated until a later date. This is the time that the existing structures that existed at Skenfrith that we touched on previously were said to have been destroyed, and new work began on a stone castle, which is what we see today at the site. De Burr again lost his castles for a time when he fell out of favor with Henry III, at which point the castles were controlled for the king by a man named Waller and Teutonicus for a short time. De Burr again briefly regained the castles for a short time, but soon fell out of favor again and eventually died. Waller and Teutonicus again was given charge of the castles for a time, who added a chapel to Skenfrith and roofed the round keep with lead. By 1254, however, the three castles were given to Henry III's eldest son Edward, the future King Edward I, often referred to as Longshanks or the Hammer of the Scots. Edward is famous for his castle building in Wales, and he began further work on the three castles, although much of it was at neighboring White Castle, and very little, if anything, was done at Skenfrith, which was, along with Grossmont, already a nicely updated castle. Llewellyn up Griffith's rebellion in 1260, which brought the three castles to the edge of hostile territory after Llewellyn's gains were recognized in 1267, made the three castles militarily important. In 1267, the castles were granted to Henry III's younger son, the younger brother of Edward I, known as Edmund Crouchback, who was the Earl of Lancaster. The three castles would remain in Lancastrian hands, or in the Duchy of Lancaster, until 1825, which, if counting, is 558 years. However, it was here in the late 13th century that the beginning of the end began for the three castles. Edward I became king in 1272 after Henry III's death, and he ultimately defeated Llewellyn up Griffith, killing him and conquering Wales as a whole along the way. This largely meant that the three castles were no longer as important militarily or strategically, although they would continue to be centers of administration for some time. The three castles transitioned from Edmund Crouchback after his death in 1296 to his son Thomas of Lancaster, who was involved in the opposition to the new detested king at the time, Edward II. Thomas was executed for treason in 1322, and his lands, including the three castles, transitioned to the crown under Edward II. However, by the time that Edward III came to the throne in 1327, the executed Thomas of Lancaster's younger brother, Henry, had come back into favor and thus Henry was reinstated as the Earl of Lancaster by the new king, which put the three castles back in the Lancastrian possession away from the crown. After Henry, who was the third Earl of Lancaster, died, his eldest son, the famous Henry of Grossmont, who played a large role in the reign of Edward III, the Hundred Years' War, and the beginning of the Order of the Garter, became the Earl of Lancaster, and thus owner of the three castles. Henry of Grossmont, who eventually was elevated to the rank of Duke of Lancaster, had no sons, but one of his daughters, Blanche of Lancaster, married Edward III's famous third son, a man named John of Gaunt. After the death of Blanche's sister Maud, the three castles came into the possession of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. John of Gaunt and Blanche were, of course, the parents of King Henry IV, also known as Henry Bolingbroke. After Edward III died, his grandson, Richard, son of the Black Prince, became King Richard II, and he attempted to disinherit his first cousin, Henry, the future Henry IV, after Henry's father, John of Gaunt, died. But Henry was able to mount a successful bid for the throne from exile on the continent to depose and eventually execute Richard in order to become King Henry IV himself. After this, the three castles once again became royal assets due to the crown belonging to the House of Lancaster at the time. Still, the castles remained as economic centers but continued to see no military use. That is, with the exception of the rebellion of Owen Glendower in the 15th century. The end of the Glendower Rebellion between 1415 and 1421 was the last act of military service for the Three Castles. As the Wars of the Roses came and went, and the Tudor dynasty came to be, the castles were said to have fallen into disrepair and largely abandoned by 1538, which would have been during the reign of Henry VIII. The Three Castles remained in Lancastrian hands until 1825, when they were sold to Henry Somerset VI, Duke of Beaufort. By 1902, the Beaufort Estate broke up the Three Castles, and Skenfrith passed through several hands before being given to the National Trust. Skenfrith Castle is currently maintained by Cadu Welsh Historic Monuments. Let us now take a closer look at the construction and layout of Skenfrith Castle.
Skinfrith Castle is located on the east side of the village of Skinfrith between the town and the river Mono. It consists of a rectangular shaped ward with circular towers on all four corners with an additional circular tower on the west side of the curtain wall. All of the towers remain intact with the exception of the northwest tower which has been largely destroyed with the exception of its foundation. There is also a stone circular keep in the center of the inner ward and a range of building remains along the west and north walls. The central circular stone keep would have housed high status individuals, most likely Hubert de Burr himself, and the floors would have been accessed internally from a spiral stair, which would have protruded from the west side of the keep. The approach to the castle would have been from the north, and a gatehouse would have been situated in the northern wall, but the gatehouse unfortunately no longer exists. Although two towered round gatehouses were coming into use at the time, Skenfrith was not thought to have had this, and the gatehouse here was said to have been square. There would have been a wet moat surrounding the castle, which also no longer exists, and thus there is a large staircase which goes under the eastern part of the curtain wall, which is thought to have been a water gate. Of course, this gate today simply leads to the outer part of the castle. It is believed that the northern wall structure would have been the chapel, and that the block of buildings to the west that is seen today would have been domestic lodgings and or a hall. However, the lower level suffered from flooding, and still does to this day, and would have been filled in during medieval times. These lower rooms have been excavated in modern times in order to show off the structure of the chambers that were below the hall or domestic rooms that existed above. What is seen today in the west block would have most likely been the basements of a hall and or rooms which would have been above it. The wall that separates the northern and central chambers is thought to have been a later addition, and these two rooms are thought to have been one at one time. The southernmost room of the west block reflects a fireplace that was thought to have been added sometime after de Burr, probably during the 13th century, during the time of Henry III or Edward I. Just south of the southernmost chamber of the west range of buildings is a square tank, which was probably a water reservoir. Although not visible, there were kitchens on the east side, just to the south of the water gate stair, and the remnants of an oven can be seen in the eastern wall. An oven of uncertain origins, thought to have possibly been from a previous kitchen, can be seen in the northeast quadrant of the inner ward. Here is an artist recreation of the castle, as it may have existed in the 13th century. We can see the moat, the gatehouse, the chapel, the western block, and the central round keep. Also, note the hoardings above the round keep, the curtain walls, and the towers. As far as timing of construction goes, archaeological excavations have produced evidence that an earlier Norman Mott and Bailey style castle would have existed on the site which would have dated to the time of William Fitz Osborne. But in the early 13th century, between 1219 and 1232, Hubert de Burr returned from his captivity on the continent and began to update the site considerably. As we touched on previously, the entire site, at the time filled with wooden and a few stone structures, was wiped clean by Hubert de Burr in order to begin the current stone castle. Much of what is seen today at Skenfrith was the work of de Burr during this time, with the exception of a few things. The circular tower to the west was added during the later 13th century, probably during the time of Henry III or Edward I, and was built into the existing curtain wall. Additionally, the possible chapel, the oven, the kitchen, the staircases, both leading down to the domestic buildings to the west and to the water gate to the east, could have been later additions as well. Lastly, near the southeast tower, a postern gate or sally port exists on the south wall, and what is thought to have been a latrine exists on the east wall. With that, let us take a look at what features can still be seen at Skinforth Castle today. We will not get into every feature still visible at Skenforth Castle to this day, but there are still many interesting details present within the castle that one can look for if ever visiting the site. Beginning on the road looking to the north, we can see the southwest tower, the curtain wall, and the later central tower built into the west curtain wall. We can see that the stones around what used to be the arrow loops have been robbed over the centuries. There is one arrow loop still visible today at Skenforth, which retains its original dressed stones, which we will see shortly. Moving a little closer, we can see the west tower, about halfway between the southwest and northwest tower. Again, this tower was added later during the 13th century and was cut into the existing curtain wall. All of the rest of the towers and the curtain wall date from the time of Hubert de Burgh during the 13th century. 
As we continue past the west tower, we come to the northwest corner of the castle. We can see that the northwest tower is almost completely destroyed, and all that remains is its foundation. This image also shows the issues that this side of the castle has with flooding. The castle has historically had flooding issues, and this caused changes to be made to the interior, which we will get to shortly. As we continue around to the northeast corner of the castle, we stand in what used to be the wet moat, and we can see the northeast tower, which, if viewed closely, holds the lone arrow slit that still exists in the castle to this day. Heading back to the north of the castle, we come to the former gatehouse, which no longer stands. Looking at this image from the 18th century, we can see the remains of what the gatehouse used to look like before it was completely destroyed. Again, although this castle was being updated during the time of Hubert de Burr, he did not construct a gatehouse flanked by two round towers, as this style was just beginning to come around in England at that time. Of course, from here we can also see the remains of the central round tower within the inner ward. As we enter through the gatehouse, we turn right immediately and see the remains of what is believed to have been the chapel. Further past the chapel is the backside of the demolished Northwest Tower and the north room of the block of domestic buildings. In its heyday, this chapel along with the domestic buildings would have formed an L-shaped range within the castle walls. As we head further into the castle turning northwest, we come to a flight of stairs and a ramp leading down to the north room of the domestic block, this block dating to the time of the castle's construction as well. The wall to the east of the ramp down is a modern installation. An interesting thing to point out here is the window located on the ramp, which still has the original medieval iron within its pane. This image also reflects standing water in the north room. The lower floors of these buildings were thought to have been filled in at some point to combat flooding issues. Again, they have since been excavated in modern times to give access to them and to show how the west block would have been laid out. Moving back a bit to the south, we can see the remains of the stair leading down to the central room of the west block and the center wall dividing the northern room and the central room. A blocked fireplace in this area has given some cause to conclude that the above floor was probably a hall, and like at Grossmont Castle, a solar or private room may have existed on the north end of this block. This has been concluded due to the fact that fireplaces are usually in the centers of halls, and the lower fireplace would have used the same vent as the fireplace above. The location of this means that there was probably excess room at the north of the western block, which could have been a private room. As we head even further south, we look north from the southern end of the three western block rooms. The third and southernmost room of the western domestic block currently sits higher than the central and northern rooms and is thought to have been the level that the buildings sat after the basements had been filled in. Currently there is a stair, thought to have been from the 13th century, leading up from the central room to the southern room. This south room has a fireplace that is also thought to have been added later in history. Furthest south is a rectangular pit, probably used as a water reservoir. As we head across the courtyard to the east side of the castle, we see the stairs down to what would have been the water gate due to the fact that the opening at the bottom would have led to the moat that no longer exists. To the right of this would have been the kitchens, which reflect an oven built into the curtain wall, and to the left of this would have been the round oven built into the northeast quadrant of the castle, although it is unknown exactly what this was used for or if it was part of an earlier kitchen. Both of these features can be seen from this aerial image. As we head to the center of the inner ward of the castle, we view the central round tower. This three-story tower, along with almost everything else visible at the castle today, dates from the time of Hubert de Burr in the 13th century and would have most likely been the last addition to the castle. We can see two entrances here, one on the second level, first if you're British, and one at the first or ground level. The original entrance would have been via a wooden stair on the second level, and there would have most likely been a wooden porch style structure that extended from this doorway, as evidenced by the two holes above the doorway. The lower level door is a later addition and would not have been an original part of the tower. This tower, along with the rest of the towers and walls, would have most likely had wooden hoardings on top of it, and its upper floor would have been a very high status apartment for the Lord. Indeed, it was most likely the upper floor of this tower that Hubert de Burr himself stayed as there was a fireplace and a latrine within the tower. Here is an artist's recreation of what the tower could have looked like in the 13th century. Note the spiral staircase's location, which we will get to shortly. From this angle, we can also see the remains of what is believed to be a postern gate or sally port 
near the Southeast Tower, which is now blocked. To the east of the Southeast Tower is a hole in the curtain wall thought to have been a latrine. It should be noted that the exterior towers on the four corners of the castle were all similar and were believed to have been strictly military in function. The entrance to these towers were six to eight feet off the ground and would have been accessed via a wooden stair. As we step into the tower, we catch a glimpse of the high status amenities on the upper floors, which again includes windows, a fireplace, and a latrine. The ground level or basement was lit by thin arrow loops and much of the dressed stone surrounding the windows has been robbed here as well. As we head to the rear of the tower looking to the northeast, we catch a glimpse of the protrusion from the central tower which would have housed the spiral stair. As we exit the castle through the water gate and travel a short distance to the east, we are greeted with sights of the Mono River which flows next to Skenfrith and surely played a role in Skenfrith being developed where it is. If you're interested in visiting Skinforth Castle, you can find more information on Kadu's website, link in the description. Okay, that concludes the history of Skinforth Castle in Monmouthshire, Wales. This is Brief History signing off. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you on the next one. Cheers.